thank you, David, for that generous introduction. Uh, and it's always a great pleasure to, to be at this meeting. It's really a great chance to be able to catch up on many of the areas in hematology uh, in a very concise way. So as uh, I was assigned this topic, I think it's a very timely one uh, and very clinically relevant. Because as you manage your patients with MPNs, uh, almost without uh, exception, you will have information on the driver mutations at that time of diagnosis, whether you diagnose them or whether they come to see you for a second opinion. So you have this cohort of patients who are, quote, triple negative, uh, and I have a bit of a chance to share with you what does that really mean. Uh, and then uh, later on in this morning's session, uh, my colleague John Mascarenes, who we together work on organizing clinical trials for the NCI-supported uh, MPN Research Consortium, have a range of different studies we're looking at in higher risk patients with MPNs and those post-ruxolitinib. So first, really, what are triple negative MPNs? I always, particularly uh, leading colleagues who represent the full spectrum of hematology and medical oncology, always use this term with a little bit of trepidation uh, in that my breast cancer colleagues typically make fun of us for, for uh, trying to claim uh, this uh, term triple negative that clearly was uh, first, uh, uh, let's say, copyrighted by our colleagues in, in breast cancer, but still uh, a helpful concept. So as we think about MPNs, these are clearly a series of disorders, PV, ET, and myelofibrosis, that have a whole range of different ways that they can overlap phenotypically, from their blood counts, from spleen size, from symptom burden. Uh, so clearly, differentiating amongst them are important goals as we try to treat these individuals. So what is triple negative? Well, triple negative specifically relates to the three key driver mutations, JAK2, CALR, MPL. It is those individuals that lack one of those three key driver mutations. Most relevant for those individuals with ET and myelofibrosis. In P. vera, the vast majority will have either the JAK2 V617F or the exon 12. These are the updated WHO diagnostic criteria. The first key takeaway point I would have you uh, take away from this talk is that if you have a triple negative patient, the burden really is on you to be certain that they really have an MPN to begin with. So this must be with a marrow, and you must be pretty certain based on the phenotype as well as the bone marrow histology that it truly is an MPN patient uh, and it is not a secondary cause for their findings. Now, triple negative, as we build on our information regarding molecular prognostication, that is where triple negative falls. So one, what about karyotype? Well, we know in the sister disease of CML, karyotype obviously was the gold standard with the Philadelphia chromosome. Amongst the pH negative MPNs, there really is not one smoking bullet karyotypically. This graph shows very nicely the range of karyotypic abnormalities. There are certain chromosomes where there's a lot of activity, 9 and 13 and 14, 1 and others, uh, 20, uh, yet there's not one clear smoking gun. Now, as we think about the spectrum of these three driver mutations, meaning these mutations we feel help to drive the MPN phenotype, in P. vera, triple negative is really not a player. Everyone should have a JAK2 mutation, or if they do not, uh, one needs to be very certain they have PV, but triple negative is a concept primarily for ET and myelofibrosis. And as you'll see, in ET that represents a, a subset of individuals, perhaps 14%, and we'll get around to that prognostic implication. And in myelofibrosis, it again is a group that ranges from 10 to uh, up to uh, uh, 15% or so. So what is the implications of being triple negative? Well, historically, prognosis in myelofibrosis, which has been heavily studied, developed a couple prognostic scores that primarily were utilizing clinically available information, cytopenias, white count blasts, symptoms, and age. And these largely 
were developed in the pre-Jack II Calar MPL era. Over time, we've been finding the implications of these individual mutations on survival. In ET, what one can say most clearly is that patients with calreticulin likely have a lower rate of thrombosis. And those who are triple negative probably have a higher rate of thrombosis than those who have a calreticulin mutation. It probably is not able to be clearly distinguished from MPL or JAK2. In myelofibrosis, the implications of being triple negative are the most clear. With these individuals having a worse prognosis for survival, largely independent of how that is assessed. Individuals have looked to see what is the relevance in regards to outcomes after stem cell transplantation. And one can predict that individuals that are triple negative will have worse outcomes with stem cell transplant. And we'll get into in a moment why that might be the case. Now, in myelofibrosis, one area that has been evolving is recognizing that there is a spectrum of disease. Those individuals by WHO criteria that have, quote, prefibrotic myelofibrosis and those that have more overt myelofibrosis. This group of prefibrotic is a group that in the past we probably would have labeled as ET. But from the beginning, we knew that they were likely more problematic ET patients. They maybe had splenomegaly. They maybe had leukocytosis. They maybe had a little bit of leukoerythroblastosis. Uh, these individuals can be triple negative, and they clearly have worse outcomes. And as we'll show you, likely a higher rate of progression. Now, what about the additional somatic mutations? Now that we can all access more broad myeloid panels, whether that's through Foundation One, whether that's through Mayo Med Lab, or other commercially available platforms, one can identify a range of additional mutations, of which some of these repeatedly are found to be bad players, and not only in MPNs, but also in MDS and other myeloid disorders, ASXL1, IDH1 and 2 mutations, EZH2, P53 mutations, all of these repeatedly surface as bad actors. Now it's been found that the presence of these higher risk molecular features as well predict worse outcomes with myelofibrosis. And the more of these high risk molecular features you have, the worse you do. So these prognostic uh, markers are helpful, particularly for myelofibrosis. Indeed, as one pulls out these individual mutations, one is able to identify that they clearly do worse. And this, of course, is a biological clue. This is a subset of patients who do worse, and the implications in terms of the pathophysiology is still in uh, study. Now, all of this put together, uh, the most recent set of prognostic scores put together, and this is probably the most relevant at the time being, is for prognostication regarding the decision to go to stem cell transplant for individuals with myelofibrosis. Fortunately, as with any of these complex scores, there is a website one can go to to just plug in the clinical variables. I tell our trainees, don't bother memorizing scores. There's too many of them, they change too quickly. You know, it's helpful to have some sense of what goes into these scores so that because each of them have a clue regarding biology. There are clinical features, cytopenias, symptoms, fibrosis, uh, but in addition, the presence of these high-risk molecular features are highly relevant. It's important to use this new updated scoring system in that it largely re-triages people from the prior scoring systems that did not include molecular features. So this is most relevant regarding the decision for transplant. So what is the biological implications of being triple negative? Well, one, there has been efforts done to look at this group more intensely. What consists this group that have a triple negative? One, it has been found that a subset of these still do have JAK2 or MPL mutations, but they are non-canonical. In other words, the breakpoints, et cetera, are different than the typical changes, yet the phenotype ends up remaining the same. So it's not V617F, 
It's something more idiosyncratic, but the outcome is basically the same. Uh, they do show that the majority of these are, they are able to prove that they are clonal uh, even without these mutations. There was this nice, there was this nice abstract presented uh, at uh, IHA uh, uh, a year or two ago by our colleagues in Italy that tried to see what this group consists of. A and what they identified is that by the driver mutation category, patients with triple negative disease had the highest likelihood of having multiple high-risk molecular lesions. So that these other factors, ASX01, IDH1 and 2, are overrepresented in this group. Again, showing the biology. Well, why do they do worse? They do worse because they have many of these mutations. So at least getting closer to understanding the biology of why these patients do worse. Uh, and indeed, as one looks at the prevalence or the frequency of these individual bad acting mutations by the driver mutation category, in orange, you see the triple negative patients were again, some of the worst actors, ASX01, SRSF2, EZH2, these are all seemingly overrepresented in individuals who are triple negative, in particular those three, SRSF2, IDH, uh, and SF3B1 are all overrepresented. So how does this factor into our therapy for individuals with MPNs? So one, as I mentioned, Patients with PV, it really is a non-factor. So let's focus on ET and myelofibrosis. In short, in ET, it does not change your decision-making at the current time. These are our current NCCN guidelines. And here, as we stratify by risk, very low risk or low risk, the thing that pulls patients out is that if they are JAK2 mutated, because the JAK2 mutated patients are ones that clearly have a higher risk of thrombosis and have implications in terms of therapy. So triple negative patients, at least by our guidelines, we do not change our recommendations regarding cytoreduction. Intermediate risk remains the same. So really regarding the management of ET, it's JAK2 V617F versus non-JAK2 V617F in terms of our decisions for cytoreduction in low and intermediate risk. Higher risk patients, we will be treating with cytoreduction regardless, indeed. Now, what about myelofibrosis? With myelofibrosis, the takeaway point is that triple negative have implications really regarding our decisions regarding stem cell transplantation. We do not have information to suggest that patients that are triple negative have any differential response to medical therapy. So it should not alter the decision as to when to start a major, uh, medicine like ruxolitinib or dose adjustments or things of that nature. It really is regarding transplantation. In low risk individuals, again, our NCCN guidelines have been based on the prior risk scores. With the updated risk scores, if an individual is low risk, it still probably does not change our treatment algorithm, which is asymptomatic patients to observe, symptomatic, to consider medical therapy. Individuals that have intermediate risk, this is the most heterogeneous group, and by the updated MIPSS 70, this is a group that you really wanna have that high risk molecular uh, profile done. Because this group, largely, some will be triaged to be much higher risk. You know, if I have the 49 year old that has two high risk molecular features, and their intermediate risk because they're anemic, that's a dramatically different risk likely than let's say the 66 year old individual who has none of those abnormal features. And again, for these, we will consider a range that truly goes from observation to allotransplant. And the reason it is so broad is that this group is the most heterogeneous. This is a group that really is the one that you need to have those molecular profiles. So we put that into the NCCN guidelines to really help to facilitate reimbursement around that part. This is a group that really needs to have that done. Individuals that are higher risk, again, 
this is helpful information to obtain, but probably does not alter our decision whether or not we should move to a stem cell transplant. It's clear that if they are a good transplant candidate, that at least needs to be a strong consideration. Non-transplant candidates, our standard of care is ruxolitinib with triaging based on dose, symptoms, response, et cetera. Now, those following the presentation will see that we know that the triple negative patients are still the group that do the worst with transplant. Now, they still might be cured, but they do the worst. So it is here where I think that the clinical trials influencing the transplant process, should we look at different conditioning or different post-transplant strategies to try to decrease rates of relapse, I think are important. To take a patient blindly through who's triple negative into a standard transplant, uh, again, I think that that's an opportunity for us to really try to push the envelope further uh, and that this group, we have a greater concern of their relapse. So I'd conclude by saying this. The implications on treatment, one, ET patients, they likely have a worse prognosis, maybe a slightly higher risk of vascular events, maybe a higher rate of changes to myelofibrosis. That being said, it's difficult to know compared to what. So individuals, this helps to separate the individuals with more difficult ET from those with a very indolent disease. It still probably does not change medical therapy, but that may change in the future. In PV, if individuals are truly JAK negative, one needs to be very certain they truly have PV and that it is not a secondary phenomenon, uh, of which by far the greatest likelihood in our society remains occult obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, even individuals who are on a therapy with a CPAP machine, the number of people in which that mask just does not fit well uh, is greater than you might expect. So that and people really uh, occultly sneaking in their testosterone supplementation, there, there is a lot of, of, of hidden secondary erythrocytosis out there. And MF is clearly the biggest implications for triple negative. The prognosis is clearly worse. Uh, it clearly impacts the decision regarding with allotransplant along with additional somatic mutations. Uh, and clearly, this is a group that is highly worthy of more intensive therapy when appropriate. And with that, gladly answer any questions.